Good morning. Good to be back. Welcome to the Bladder Conference 2024. And it's keynote time again. So let's start. So last year, this year, in April, I was in uh, Los Angeles visiting Beacon LA, the first independently organized Blender conference. This was, of course, another highlight of the year. I totally enjoyed it, especially to see how, wherever it is in the world, if you get people, Blender users, people with enthusiasm for 3D and open source coming together, you get this special vibe. And the LA conference was just like here. It was a great conference, and the best part was I didn't have to do anything. <laughs> what? I could just disappear, and everybody would have fun. So, fantastic. So I was walking around in the, uh, in the streets of Los Angeles thinking about uh, a theme for my keynote. Right? And I had some ideas for thinking about it. And I suddenly saw a billboard, and I thought, that's it. But before I show the billboard, I'm going to talk about all the highlights of the year. Uh, my favorite thing, uh, Blender, Blender features. So I'll mention a couple. Like the, we have the extensions platform. And not only is the extensions platform important uh, for the community, it's a community-driven system to make free add-ons available for everyone. This is also uh, the first experiment with Blender to do something with the internet. And with internet technology, you know, it's very useful, but Blender is separated from it because we want Blender to keep running without. But we should also allow Blender to run with, right? That's too far as an option. So the extensions platform allows you to do uh, versions and revisions, automatic updates, which is a useful feature to have. And this whole API is also being rolled out for other marketplaces or add-on repositories that they can use a similar system. <clears throat> then, of course, we had EV, EV Next. Uh, do you remember how weird it would have been to think about having ray tracing working in the viewport, right, for your time, for, for you when you're doing things? It's just happening. So I'm super proud of that. This is also a little bit related to having Vulkan. Uh, Vulkan is a back-end thing. Maybe many people haven't heard of it, but Vulkan is the next graphic standard of the industry. Uh, they're uh, dropping OpenCL slowly, and everything will become Vulkan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Vulkan <coughs> Blender is one of the first uh, 3D applications that fully supports it, and in the next release, it will be available for everybody to use. And then in the coming releases, we will fade out OpenCL uh, completely. Uh, Vulcan is one of the reasons why we get so well supported by the industry, uh, Intel, AMD, NVIDIA. Uh, they're all uh, heavily investing in Vulcan. <coughs> Grease Pencil. Everybody knows Grease Pencil, Grease Pencil 3. Uh, we've been working with the core developers to align the whole Grease Pencil technology better, that is better integrated. So one of the great things is now that you also have geometry notes and Grease Pencil working together. So, Imagine crazy stuff that's going to do. I also would like to mention that Grease Pencil is one of the reasons why the film industry is really looking into Blender. Because it's all the concept artists and the, uh, the storyboarders, the story artists, they're all using it for developing film. <coughs> and then one of my favorites, uh, Node Tools. Actually, now, without any programming, you make a node tree, you noodle everything together, and then you can make that a tool inside of the, the UI. And you click around, or you can have a menu, or you can make it in the toolbar, and program your own functionality using node trees, which you then can share with everyone as a little blend file. <coughs> so, I'm not going to talk about every blender feature, uh, you can hold, in the whole conference, you can find so many uh, people talking about it, from the animation system to the sequencer. So I want to talk a little bit about what artists are doing with Blender. They keep amazing. <coughs> this, for example, I kind of seen it. This is uh, one guy in China making everything in Blender, Blender release.
another one, the, the winner of the Jury Award of the NSC Festival, and uh, in the running for an Oscar, it's a European film, uh, Latvian, French, also made entirely in Blender by a wonderful team. It's a presentation of the conference by the uh, mission director about this. And this is also a show so special. Research. So, who would ever have thought that Sega, well, the masters of uh, game design and game makers, they would use Blender and start making a series with Sonic. All done in Blender, also rendered in Psycho Spot City. And uh, it looks stunning. And then, of course, there's the random stuff that I pick from the internet. For example, this. Uh, we've been talking about getting the game engine back in Blender. Well, it's already there. You can have complete game experiences uh, done in Blender. And this is not Psycho, as well as Eevee or so. This is Cycles, real-time Cycles, to do interactive stuff and move around. So I was talking about the highlights of the year. Another highlight we had, of course, was uh, the 30th birthday of Blender. <laughs> Woo! Can you imagine? I think that half, half of the audience has not even, was not even born in 94, right? It's, just, it's really a weird thing that Blender is older than you, but that's it. And then uh, we made the annual report of the Blender Foundation. I guess we all read the annual report, right? We know everything in it. But I would like to mention a couple of things. For example, uh, we have a new board member, which is Francesco Shady. <laughs> so Francesco, <coughs> he's on the board of the foundation, but also in the institute and the studio. It's the working companies of the foundation. So he's like controlling everything now to, together with me. So what does it mean? that he's there, what does it mean to have a board? So I want to be very clear about it, that Blender is a community project. So Blender is being made online on blender.org with the people, uh, the, the community, working online together with the industry, and they are making Blender. And there's a big divider, and underneath is where you have the organization. That's where Blender Foundation is, the studio and the institute. And we managed to get the staff and the developers and everyone in to work on Blender projects, to support it, and to make everything, uh, to facilitate everything that is actually happening. But the staff is also contributing to the public projects. Uh, we have no secrets, there's nothing that we do uh, for the industry, because we always invite the industry to work at the same level as uh, the uh, the community. <coughs> I want to say a few words about how we organized uh, the company, but first I would like to go back five years. So yeah, I have an uh, announcement to make. So I will uh, step down as chairman of Blender Foundation, comma, one day in the future, <laughs> right? <laughs> I got you. You don't get rid of me that easily. <laughs> so yeah, that was five years ago. And, and don't worry, I'm, to, I'm not going to announce today that I'm stepping down. But I did make steps towards this goal. But I still believe that there's a moment in the future, not too long, that I should make place for other people to take over things. Especially all the boring things like running corporations and having uh, governing structures like this. So how does it work? Right? So we have executive directors on the board. The executive directors are in companies and the board is in the foundation. So in Blender, those people are the same. So Francesco and me, we are both executive directors and we are uh, board members of the foundation. 
So the next step that we are going to make is to add more directors for specific topics. So you can have operations, which is a lot of work on finance, the things that I'm doing, but you can also have uh, infrastructure or communication and product or uh, product design and uh, engineering. There are all kinds of things that you can have staff for to help organizing things better. That's on the corporate side. On the other side, where we are going to establish two boards, one is an advisory board, and that's for people who will give you advice, right? They tell you, well, you're doing great, or you're doing awesome, or maybe help you with some connections in the industry. It's very informal, sometimes even an honorary position. But we also will establish a supervisory board. Supervisory boards are very common in the, in the business, right? To have a company and a supervisory board represents the interest of the shareholders. A supervisory board for a foundation doesn't have shareholders, but we have our founding principles. That's how it works. The foundation is founded on principles, and the only thing the supervisory board does is to check if those principles are still being met by the organization. And they can do that by uh, one is approved on the annual budget, and they can appoint or fire people from the board. That's the only thing they do. So in due time, and it might be one or two years, I want to sink down from the actual board and step into the supervisory board, and then only control things more from a distance once in a while, and let people in the board do all the daily stuff to manage the project. <clears throat> Combined to that, I also was thinking about a metaphor for a new organization model. So we all know the typical pyramid, right? This is what a lot of organizations do. So you have uh, all, a lot of people, they're all average, normal, whatever people who do things. And then you go to the top, and then you get the super competent, highly talented people who get stuff done. And every organization, uh, whether that is the community on Blender.org or the, uh, the Blender Foundation, there's always a few people that are really good. And you always think, I wish I had more of those, right? There are books written about it, like the talent density from uh, Netflix, for example, to ha or Apple does it, the triple or double A people. How do you get more talent on board? And they recruit it everywhere from the industry, right? So that's what I thought, maybe we can try to do that as well, to get talent from Pixar or from Google or from all the other companies that are making amazing things and get them to work for Blender. But there are problems with those people. One is, especially, they are expensive. So they don't, you don't get them for the, a few thousand a month, right? They were used to make a lot of money in Google. This is the normal situation for them. But the other thing is, usually, they can stick, right? But they often bring in not only their talent, but they also bring in their egos and problems. And they are not always the right fit for the organization. So they go away or they do other stuff, and then you have to replace them again. So when I was talking about this with people, most of them, especially from the industry, they say, Tom, what you have with Blender is something nobody has, and that is you have a community. So instead of trying to find those people in the top and, and try to glue them and, and make them fit to become super talented, you get those talents already. Every year, new talent is coming in via the Blender project. So what we should make sure of is that if those talents pop up, that we recognize them and that we make sure that they can have access to uh, the, uh, the modules and the decision making uh, on Blender. And not only that, I thought had to prevent everything getting stuck in the top. We should also allow people to spread and to go to other places. Not everybody, of course, but instead of having Blender developers, or sorry, having uh, Google developers working for Blender, why not help a Blender developer to get a shop at Google or Pixar or Disney or whatever? That will help us even more and probably much better. <coughs> So this is not the pyramid model, so I named it the volcano model. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, now I come to the main topic of my talk. So I always try to do something a little bit controversial. Uh, the topic I thought, like, uh, why is Blender always promising things and then we don't deliver, right? The Blender Lab, interaction, game engine back, uh, animation, recode, right? There's always plans and then we don't deliver. And there's actually a topic related to this that's even more controversial, and that is money, <laughs> right? The source of all evil. <laughs> so we should talk about money for once here. And here, for example, is the annual budget that we spent in the Blender Foundation. I'm not going over every detail, but two things are interesting to see. One is at the blue part is what we spent on Blender contributors, developers. So almost uh, three quarters of your money, uh, the donation money, is being spent on people who make Blender. And the other thing you should look at is two and a half million, right? That's a lot of money, two and a half million euros. You can buy like five houses of that, right? Or 10 houses in Italy, <laughs> <laughs> a random country, right? Or a half a city in, uh, in some places. So what does it mean, money? Money is a different, a difficult topic, but money is also getting important in Blender if we want to continue our growth. So how does it relate to things, for example, like the Blender conference? Have you all bought tickets? Super expensive, 350 to 400 euros to get here. It's a shame, so much money, right? It's, uh, how, how, how and why do you do this? Well, you see the breakdown, and on the income side, you see we have uh, about uh, 220,000 euros in ticket sales. We have our awesome sponsors adding another 45,000. On the expenses side, you see that the venue actually costs money too. And the catering is half, and the rent of the venue, bam, there goes your money. And then there's all the little things, the technology, the video, and everything, 265,000. So, all this money that we get from the tickets and the sponsors is just enough to pay the bills of the venue and the technology. And the people, I me and the other staff were making this all happen, they're working for Blender Foundation or Blender Institute, and they're paid for by the donations. So yes, 400 euros is a lot for a ticket, but this is barely covering the actual cost. <coughs> other thing, people. What do people cost in the Blender organization? And we have uh, salary ranges going from 4 to 10k per month, and the developer grant, which is a very informal way to support developers to work on Blender, going to 2.5 and 5. So who's that person making 10k per month? Well, huh? uh, it's me. So <laughs> I'm really expensive. So it's a little breakdown. Where does my money go to? Well. It's 10k per month, but net, uh, you get 5,600 left in 2023, which is my contribution to Dutch society. Right? We have an awesome country with good health care and everything. It's worth some money. Then I have an expensive house. It's also investment in my pension. You have your house paid off. Uh, energy, water, pension fund, maintenance, and all that. And I have 1,500 a month left to do all the stuff that I want. And I'm super happy with that. So that's what it means to get this. So it's a lot of money, but also compared to the marketplace, uh, people who are competent nowadays, are developers who work for Google, they easily make two, three times more. <coughs> so let's talk about the ecosystem then around Blender, the Blender market. Huh? The total volume in 2023 that they processed was uh, over 11 million. And uh, we had a contribution from them was 160,000, so 1.4%. Super nice. Let's look at a couple of examples in the market. So two resellers. <coughs> so you cannot see the numbers, maybe, but one of them uh, has 15,000 uh, add-ons sold, and the other one had uh, 14,000 over the past six, seven years. And if you add that up, that's a lot of money. So add-on makers make one of them made one million, the other made uh, 700k, maybe with some help from others. But they are paid, uh, the top add-on makers, better than the average Blender developer. 
I don't mind, I know how the market works, and this is very good, but it should make you think a little bit, right? <clears throat> Another example is the STEAM workshop. A STEAM workshop is also one of the top contributors to the Blender uh, Foundation as a donator. Our agreement with STEAM doesn't allow us to, uh, to mention the numbers, but they are at the top. And what they do is they reserve parts of their revenues, set the revenues of Valve with the store, to charity, and the resellers can pick which of the charities will get this money. But it's a very nice model, it works very well. So we also talk to the blended market about shifting the way how uh, donations work in the market, where we put the uh, decision to donate at the level of the resellers and don't make the buyers think that by buying in the market you also support the blender project. It's, uh, that's not a good message, but we are working with them on it. <coughs> Last example is Thunderbird. This is uh, the mail program, open source. They have a similar diagram to us. Eh? Three quarters of their money also goes to, to people to work on things. But they have very interesting numbers. So they got 8.6 million donations in last year from individuals, eh? not corporations. 300,000 people donated. In total, there are 500,000 gifts. They have 18 million users eh? who start on the board once a month. So that's big. So 1.7% of their users donate. Very, very good. <coughs> so how does that compare to Blender? I have to go back to the, the Blender numbers. So the income in the past three years is divided in a number of uh, parts. Uh, the first part, the patron, here is the, the top level uh, donators. It went down a little bit, but that's because we made patron level double as expensive for so some people kept the same amount and they became a regular corporate member of the development fund. It's the second graph that went up. Then there were some other large sponsors from corporations. That's the the market, which went slightly down, but it's quite constant. And then you can see that recurring donations, and especially small donations, went up very well. So if you look at the individuals who donated to Blender, this was for, uh, half a million in uh, 2022, and currently we are going to about 1.4 million. But this increase is super, super good. I have it drawn in another diagram where you can see how much corporations are paying, which is yellow, versus how many uh, are users contributing to Blender. And you can see that the trend is slowly users are taking back more control, which is something that's awesome. So are users becoming more awesome, right? Is that it? Or maybe it's something else. Well, it was also because we started communicating much better. Because Blender's donation campaigns are very friendly and quiet, right? They're not really in the way. So a lot of people forget about it. But you should put it more in your face. And you have to make sure that the process of donating is simple. And not too complicated. No registration allowed. You don't have to fill in addresses and all the state. And you have to go 20 steps deep. And then you think, whatever, I'm not going to donate. So now we have a UI that you can donate like almost in two clicks and your money is gone, right? <laughs> that's the ideal way of donate. And that's uh, what we've been uh, implementing. So this is working very well for us. Last thing, so how many users would we have then? So how can we calculate this? So yeah, we have 20 million downloads last year. That's OK. But we only count people who have not ad blockers. So, how many people here have ad blockers? Um, <laughs> the other way around, who does not have an ad blocker? Look, so you guys download Blender 20 million times, you know? <laughs> so the, the actual number of downloads, including all the other websites that uh, spread Blender, is way bigger than 20 million. But you don't know, you can't count it. So. But we do know that we have, uh, based on IP addresses, 29 million unique visitors on uh, Blender.org. And we have Blender IDs, uh, registration for people. If you submit a bug report, <coughs> you want to have a, a recurring donation, buy a conference ticket, then you have a registration. Over half a million people did that. So what is it? 2 million, 1 million, 4 million? How do you calculate the amount of users of Blender? 
So currently, I think it's between two and four. <clears throat> if you have that number, you can look at how does it compare to something like another project. At Thunderbird, 18 million users blended two to four million. Thunderbird had $8 million, we had 840K, right? 10% of that. The 300,000 people donate for a mail program, but only 10,200 people in 2023 donating for Blunder. So yeah, that's a bit of a difference. Luckily, the numbers for 24 are way better. Well, this thanks to our better UI. And this is also going to be our message for the coming campaign, but there will be a more aggressive donation campaign next month. So we want 2% of our users to donate to Blunder. It's just 2%, right? So 98% can use it for free, but the decision that you have to make, each of you individually, is am I going to be part of the 98% who has it for free, or am I going to be part of the 2% that will help making Blender possible, right? No pressure, your decision. <laughs> Good. Final thoughts. In my office, I have an artwork, a great piece of art from Carlo Isabella. He gave it to me. I always look at it. It's a very interesting thing. You see people lining up, getting blindfolded, running at a gate, getting crushed. And then you see somebody making a picture with a black cap. So what is it? Ah, wait, this is Schrodinger's cut, and these are people reenacting the particle wave duality with the slit experiment, right? We all know the double slit experiment, right? This is what they're trying. So I was thinking, right? So this is an interesting metaphor, this whole particle dynamics and this theory about uh, how matter works. Are there other principles that you could apply on people? For example, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, right? We all know this. Right? This is about that you can know a position really well, or you can know its momentum. High momentum is speed times mass, yeah, the factor where things are going, the impact. You can either know that or you know that. So how would this apply to people? Well, you could say on one side you have people's identities, who you are, or your activity. Uh, identity, such as uh, culture, nationality, your skin color, uh, gender, uh, sexual preference, uh, your political beliefs, uh, anything that makes you versus your activity, which is like, what do you, uh, what is the relationship you have with the physical world or the relationship you have with other people? Uh, that could be like developer, or artist, or neighbor, or parent, or a professor, or a plumber, right? Or a community member, or citizen. So on one side you have individuals, and on the other side you have society. On one side you have what you are, and on the other side you have what you do. That's an interesting metaphor, right, to, to think about. And that's what I was thinking when I was walking in Los Angeles on the streets, and I saw this billboard. I thought, ah. That's a nice theme to end my talk with and give you as a message, a positive message. I wish you a fantastic conference, very inspiring event with lots of new connections, lots of new friendships that will have an impact on you for the coming years, on you and on Blender. So thank you.